Okay, ready to start? Here, here. Welcome uh, to the uh, August 7th, 2017 regular city council meeting. And as usual, we start the first 15 minutes with open mic. And we have brand new microphones here. So if you hear, we, you, can you hear me okay? No. No? So if you would like to talk to city council, we just ask you to come to the mic. Uh, we got three minutes and uh, we'd like to have your name. So if you'd like to take that opportunity. Now, there are some people that have a written request to talk to council. And do you want to do those now? You want, we'll do that. We'll do those during the meeting. So uh, anybody would like to address us at this time? If not, OK, well, let's just go forward. I'd like to call to order then the August 7th, uh, 2017 regular city council meeting. And can we have the invocation by Don Brightwell of the Light Behind the Door Ministries? Thank you. Would you rise, please? Mr. Mayor and council members, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I ask you to join me in prayer. Almighty God and Father, we acknowledge, along with the psalmist, that you are great and highly to be praised, gracious and merciful, generous in your loving kindness, and good to all. We give thanks for your hand of blessing on this community, for those here who represent the citizens of Canyon City and provide leadership and direction on our behalf. We ask this evening that you would provide wisdom and clarity in the discussions and decisions made here, and that all is done, all that is done, be done with grace and humility, building up our community and honoring you. We ask for your continued care for our city, our state, and our country. In the name of the one through whom we know and have access to you, amen. Would you call the roll, please? Mayor Trotman. Here. Council members Ekstrom. Here. Schumacher. Here. Gill. Here. Weed. Here. Jaquez. Here. And Meisner. Here. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you, Kathy. Well, are there any citizens that have made a request to speak to City Council, written request? Yes, we have received two. The first one is from Gregory Car Carlson. He wants to speak to Council in regard to the River Corridor plan. Gregory? Gregory need your name and your address, please. Thank you so much, Mr. Mayor. My name is Gregory Carlson, and I reside at 1151 Park Avenue uh, in Canyon City. And uh, I want to uh, start out by saying how much I appreciate uh, your public service to the community. Uh, I served on the Planning Commission for several months, and I served on the Marijuana Committee that, that met for many, many weeks. And I know how difficult it is to make consensus when there's so many groups with so many different viewpoints. Um, and I want you to know I'm here to be constructive. Um, I'm here because we found out that our uh, property was on the Arkansas River Corridor plan. And um, obviously, we were interested in that. And the reason I've been told by many people on the council and, and from the mayor that you know these master plans, they're just a vision. You know, they're just a, a vision of what the community is going to look like, kind of our collective goals, where we want to go, and how we can improve the city. And I really appreciate that, because I know we want to be more like Salida, and we want to have a smart plan going forward. But my concern is that um, there's how you feel about it and what your personal feelings are is one thing, and what the plan looks like under the law is another thing. Because um, while you can tell me, and you probably, I believe you when you say you'd never use eminent domain to take somebody's property, I believe you, I really do. But the problem is that, like, say we want to sell the land to somebody in the future, or one of the other dozens of property owners whose lands are under the microscope, surely we would have to disclose to somebody, you know, the city's got their eye on this place, you know, they, they, our, our, our land is on a current master plan to be used in some way, just FYI, and, uh, you know, we've got a very effective and aggressive city administrator, and if these plans are approved, you know, he, under the authority of council, has the ability to act and to offer recommendations based on the current master plan. And so I think if this, these plans are really just a vision, 
just a pie in the sky dream, I don't think you should approve them and put a dark cloud over all of these properties. But as I said, I'm here to be constructive and I do have a recommendation. My recommendation instead would be to reach out to the property owners, maybe one on one, and ask them what is your plan for the land? Who knows the land better than the people who've been living there for decades? And maybe the plan is in line, their plan is in line with your vision. And if that's the case, the conversation becomes, what can the city do to help you? Is there a zoning difference you need? Is there a regulation you're having difficulty with? That, I think, is a much more, if we're looking at a 30-year time scale, a much more forward-looking and less likely to start a fight way of going about it than just having this committee of random people and not let the property owners in on the conversation until the last second. And for what it's worth, I'd be more than happy myself to participate in any of those conversations. So those are my concerns. Thank you for listening to me, and I uh, appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you, Mayor. Go ahead, Mr. Weed. Yeah, it's, uh, I have a question for Catherine. It's, uh, you may be able to answer this, because I've heard this repeatedly, that these master plans essentially are putting uh, a, an encumbrance of some sort on properties. Is there any truth to that? Uh, no, I would say that there's not. It's not a legal encumbrance on the property. It shouldn't show up in title work. It shouldn't cloud the property, the title to the property. Is there any reason at all uh, in the sale of a property that's on a, on a master plan vision that they would need to disclose to the buyer that this property is on a master plan? No, there's no law that requires them to disclose that. I hope that gives you a little bit of satisfaction. Thank you. Comments, Gregory? No? Um, a question, Tony, have any of the property owners been contacted or invited to some of these meetings? Dean has talked to some. We certainly would want to follow up and talk to anyone in the corridor, particularly outside the limits of the current city. As you know, the area under review and planning extends beyond the city because of two reasons. One, priority for potential annexation and urban growth boundaries. So, you know, really uh, we have an obligation to at least look at and plan for those areas for the distance future. But as the attorney has indicated, that does not require us to put any encumbrance on the property or cloud the title or in any way, you know, diminish the, the holdings of that property owner. But conversations that could be educational and yeah. and take care of unwarranted fears might be. Yeah, but we'll definitely follow up and, and meet with all those owners, particularly the ones that are outside the corporate limits of the city. Okay. That's great. Right. The second one is from Les Payne, 1221 Greenwood. He wants to speak to council about speed bumps on Greenwood. Evening. Uh, my name is Les Payne. I live at 1221 Greenwood. Uh, and I am concerned or wondering if we can get any speed bumps on Greenwood between 12th and 15th. I live on the back side of the middle school. And it doesn't make any difference what time of day or night. If they woke me up at 2.30, 5.30 in the morning. People are racing up and down Greenwood. They'll turn off at 12th. They'll turn on off at 13th, 14th, or 15th. And I've seen them go, I'll bet, at least 60 miles an hour down through there. It's not marked as a school zone, which it should be. And I was just wondering if there's anything we can do to get people to slow down on that section of Greenwood. Is that behind Hickey Park or the Hickey Field? It's on the back side of the, the middle school right off of Main. Yes, that, that's Hickey. Is that Hickey Field? Is that what yeah. you're talking about? Yeah, that's Hickey Field. Yeah, that field. big yeah. field. Oh, I thought there were signs that say school. No. no? Well, we have, no? No, no, it's, it's marked as a school zone from uh, uh, 14th Street to uh, 11th or 10th or 12th, 11th Street. Okay, I haven't 12th seen those signs. I know they're marked on Main Street. On Greenwood. On Greenwood. On Greenwood. Yeah, Greenwood. I'm not sure about Greenwood either. It's marked on Main. Adams. It's marked on Main, but it's not Adam, on Greenwood. Adam says it is. is it marked, Adam? Right. Yeah, it's marked. Yeah, I'm sure it is, because I drive there all the time. Are you the one speeding? 60 miles an hour every night. <laughs> and sure, that's no joke. Helps. They, they actually go up and down that street 60 miles an hour. I'll bet money on it. Sir, and if it helps the man that can help fix this, I saw him putting big notes on his tablet. Okay. This gentleman in the blue suit over here. 
Okay. Make a big notes on his tablet. <laughs> you know, and, and I know the police department is probably undermanned, but I have never seen a policeman pull anybody over there to give him a ticket. Never, ever. They'll be out tomorrow. So, yeah. <laughs> so hopefully. Less, and hopefully you park out there for a week. Uh, Thank you. I was going to say, as far as um, speed bumps go, we had some citizens with similar concerns on Tanner Parkway up in Dawson's Ranch. And we um, were able to meet some of the citizens. We were able to meet with the police officers and come up with a plan to help reduce speeding on that street for a while. And through some studies, I actually found that speed bumps don't necessarily, and Dirk, you can probably correct me, but they don't necessarily reduce um, speeding overall. But there's other things that can be done to help, to help that situation. Do you have any comments? Yeah, just a couple. So um, you're right, speed uh, controlling measures like that have to be very invasive in order for it to actually control speed. And I'm sure our town engineer has quite a bit more research on that. But um, as far as the concerns about speeding, if anybody contacts the police department, I would just like for them uh, to be aware that we'll get somebody out there and follow back up with them. So the best way really to get a concern like that answered is to actually contact the non-emergency number for the police department so that we can follow up on those complaints and get the information we need to be effective in that enforcement. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Payne. Well, we're talking about that, uh, Chief. Uh, I had a call from people who live on roads. You might check roads out as well. I think one of the things that they did was have those little signs that let people be aware of how fast they really are going and as well. Do we need more signs at the safe school zone? It, it's not really signs. Um, obviously, if they're not that <coughs> visible, then it might be something that we need to look at where it's actually placed, and that's a conversation we can have afterwards. But as far as the actual education enforcement efforts uh, from the police department, if we're aware of an issue, then we have several steps that we would take to ensure that when we're parking somebody out there, that they're going to be effective for those high volume times. Um, speed trailers, for example. Um, uh, other speed study equipment that we can actually use to figure out what the high volume times are and if there is, is it a perception problem or an actual problem? And I think sometimes that information can be very helpful, but you know, my request would be is if there's a perception of a problem, at least get us involved and call us so that we can start that process rolling. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Any, thank you. That's all. Okay, then I'm going to go for the m approval of the minutes for the... Um, July 17th regular city council meeting. Are there any corrections at this time? Mr. Meisner. Well, I just have a simple question. On the last paragraph, <coughs> excuse me, page seven, it says discussion surrounded assigning President's Day to Veterans Day. Um, I thought we actually made a decision on that. That was before the motion. You guys did, dis you did. did quite a bit of discussion surrounding veteran versus. We've um, already informed the employees. Yeah. And it so the motion was to go mm -hmm. ahead and approve it, shifting President's Day to the Veterans Day in the motion. But you guys discussed it quite a bit uh, when Scott discussed I having that. it on Monday. You're right. Okay. Thank you. No problem. <laughs> that doesn't require a correction, does it? No, it doesn't. No, no it's good. Any other? Uh, Corrections? Okay, could I have a motion to second on the uh, minutes? Mr. Mayor, I'll make the motion Schumacher. to approve the minutes from the July 17, 2017 regular city council meeting as written. Second. second. Mr. Weed, second. Thank you. Would you call a roll, please? Councilmember Schumacher? Aye. Councilmember Weed? Aye. Councilmember Meisner? Aye. Councilmember Hawkes? Aye. Councilmember Gill? Aye. Councilmember Ekstrom? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Approved by unanimous vote. I, think I, I would like to welcome back Mr. Gill and Ms. Smith from your That's long right. vacations. I forgot your names you were gone. I came so in long. and my name was off the front, so I wondered if maybe something happened I didn't know about while I was gone. Well, we, we, we thought about it, but uh, welcome back. It's good to have all of you here. Okay, uh, are there any council member announcements this time? Ms. Schumacher. I have one. I would like to inform council and public that Thursday at 2 p.m. at Macon Plaza, we're kicking off the Pooh Patrol. And if any of you have been walking the parks or the paths, we have new signs considering the Poop Fairy. They don't live here. Clean up after your pets, and we're going to kick it off Thursday at 2 uh, with the Boys and Girls Club over in Macon Plaza. You're all invited. 
Mr. Gell? Terry, can you help me? There's a uh, planning commission meeting when I don't, I've lost track of the date. I just got back in town three hours ago. Sorry. We'll forgive you for that. Thank you. August 15th. August the 15th at? 7 p.m. Here. Thank yes, you. Mr. Weed? Yes, there is a general government yeah. committee meeting uh, in this room Wednesday at 4 p.m. Um, I have a question. When is the next River Quarter open house? This meeting? Thursday. Thursday. That's also this Thursday? Yeah. And what time is that? I think it was 6 to 8. So that would be a good opportunity mm -hmm. to have you voice your concerns too and yeah. invite other property owners to come and give their feedback at that open house. And just on a personal note, I would like to invite um, you all to help us celebrate our daughter's wedding. Who got, she got married last May, and she just is getting into town tonight, and we're having a celebration for her and her new husband this Wednesday at the Artist Gallery from 6 to 8. So come on after general government, and we'd love to, to, to see you there. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, thank you. Anyone else? If not, uh, there's proclamation here. I have a proclamation. Do you want me to read it? I don't think they're here, but you might want to just announce it. Okay. We have a proclamation <clears throat> for um, it's Healthcare Centers Week, uh, and uh, it is um, starts. What is it? It's August the 13th through August the 19th, and it's National Healthcare Week. And I have a proclamation which I will sign for that <coughs> occasion. Okay. All right, we have to go for the adoption of the agenda and the consent agenda. Tony, would you review the consent agenda, please? Yes, Mayor and Council. Uh, 5A was authorized a temporary street closure of Skyline Drive from 730 August 25th till 7 a.m. August 26th for the light in the darkness prayer event. Uh, item 5B would be appoint Councilman Schumacher as the ex officio member of the new Royal Gorge Regional Tourism Council. Uh, 5C would authorize city administrator to execute a professional service agreement for an access control plan for US 50 between 15th and Reynolds. This would be a study to look at the existing possibilities for width improvements, driveway access, intersection design in that particular stretch of US 50. It would be in partnership with CDOT. They'll be spending on this $100,000, and our match would be $29,000, and the company would be Stolfus and Associates who would do the work. Uh, 5D would authorize city minister to execute an MOU or Memorandum of Understanding with the Pueblo Community College for reporting of crimes, violations, and accidents at the Pueblo Community College with our police department to ensure that there's good communication and appropriate protocol. Uh, 5E would authorize city administrator to execute a member of understanding with the Fremont County and Town of Florence for a joint street narcotics and gang task force to, to more effectively investigate drug and drug-related crimes in the city and the region. 5F would authorize temporary street closure at 5th Street for the alley north of Main Street to, to Macon Avenue and 6th Street from the alley north of Main Street to the alley north of Macon Avenue and Macon Avenue from 6th Street to the 7th Street from 3 p.m. September the 9th to 10.30 p.m. September 10th for the annual Italian Festival. And the final consent item is would authorize a temporary street closure of Field Avenue between High Street and South from 6 a.m. to 5 p.m. on August 19th for the Soapbox Derby. Okay, I, and I have a, I have a question on uh, C. It, mm -hmm. the, the, what I had here in the preliminary says that uh, the access control plan is the next step in the implementation of the U.S. Highway 50 corridor plan. Is that our highway corridor plan or is it a CDOT thing? What are we talking about? ER plan. It's different than the other plan you've been working on which relates to pedestrian safety and the proposed potential use of mini medians. That is a separate project. I frankly don't recall that. I know what it looked like. Oh, can I have Adam speak to that? He can provide you some history. Because uh, I know there was concerns about the corridor plan with the center 
medians and stuff like that that were not very acceptable. Is that not it? What is this? So this is the first step in the implementation of the US 50 corridor plan for East Canyon. You may recall that's the, the talk about um, eliminating Fremont Drive, opening up direct access back to the highway on the north side. So this is the first step in doing that. So this is the one that actually gave more access to Highway 50? Correct. Okay. Yeah. yeah. This is the first step to identify all the existing accesses and then identify how those would look with the new plan. Okay. The only concern I frankly had, to be quite honest with you, is with the way I think the CDOT has messed up our town and going on Highway 50, that I have a concern about them, what they're doing. But this is our, pl our plan that we're following after. Yeah, this is our plan. There, oh. There'll be something similar to this coming forward at a later date for the downtown section that, that you're probably thinking okay. about, that everyone's really concerned about. Where does about. this stop? Uh, this is from 15th to Reynolds. to Reynolds. To where? 15th to Reynolds. Okay. It's about a mile and a half section of the road. Yeah, I saw the mile and a half. And I just was alarmed when we're, is anybody from CDOT? Because I'm not happy with what is occurring and what is occurring in our <laughs> traffic on Highway 50 and the streetlights. Good question. No, this is, this um, is our plan, all right. and it has to do with eliminating the Fremont Drive and going back to having direct access to the north side like it was before they did their project. Well, in light of that, I would like to have CDOT come talk to us. I'm very unhappy with what they've done. I know that has nothing to do with this. I got that. But I'm not happy with the street lights. I'm not happy with what they did to Canyon City. Okay. That's not your problem. Sorry. <laughs> it's all right. I'm done venting. <laughs> all right. Yes, sir, Mr. Meisner. Uh, doesn't it say somewhere in this plan that the intention of the plan is to reduce the, amount of the number of access points? Right. So what it is is what they mean is now right now CDOT considers every access point to the highway, including Fremont Drive. So right now, there's not very many access points to, to the highway, but there's a bunch to Fremont Drive. So we're talking about consolidating where we can consolidate off of Fremont Drive back to the highway. So an example would be, um, let's say, City Market. Yeah, so City Market right now has like, there's like two accesses to the City Market Big R parking lot, then there's an access to the Smokers Friendly and all that. What we're talking about is opening up an access directly to the highway for that shopping area, but they might all share one big one. That make sense. Does that make sense? If you said it does. <laughs> all right. And that's going to, all the way to Highway 50, across Fremont Drive. Right. Fremont Drive would be, would be gone. Yeah. Would it be right turn only, or would it be able to cross the traffic? That's what this study's for. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. And this, and <laughs> this, as we talked to you before about the stuff downtown, and these access plans, every single individual property owner has to be custom discussed with okay. just so you know that's part of, that's part of the state statute on the access planning process okay because, I mean, go ahead. because this is in a sense our plan that we're looking at and everything if there's any changes to that is all the cost for those changes going to come from us or is CDOT going to be we our the pleasure? construction dollars haven't been identified yet okay but they're paying for the majority of this first step. Okay. I'm still not happy with what they did. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. I still have a question or questions. In the whole process of what I'm going to say, the scope of work, there's mention of stakeholder committee, but I don't ever see where it actually mentions the makeup of that committee, or am I missing something? That's a little leftover from what we were, um, we, we intentionally had CDOT set it up similar to our committee process that we've been going through recently that we've set up for different things. <clears throat> and then we found out afterwards that when, um, when they said that basically you have to go, that legally you have to go and talk to every single property owner anyway, um, and you guys would be the approving um, body for the access plan before it gets acted upon anyway, that that's really an unnecessary step. So that may be remnants of what's left in there, but it's not actually a cost item. But there are several references to stakeholder committee meetings. Right. The and they're, the and they're, they're calling you the stakeholder committee. Mm -hmm. So you're the, new, you're the public board that they will present to. Is that what we want? Yeah, because what we're going to do, see, but previously you'd have a representing body, a committee that would represent 
and, and we kind of we may have boogered that up a little bit on the crossing study stuff you may re recall part of that is you were, we would have a representative body um, you know 10 to 20 people that would meet to make a decision or recommendation for the whole corridor in this case we have to go meet with each individual property owner anyway so you're going to get their direct feedback so there's no sense there's no re requirement to have a separate body from you to meet and discuss would they still be invited to come and give their input face oh, to face? Oh, absolutely, yeah, counsel? yeah. Because there's there are going to be people that aren't happy with what we end up with. There's no way we're going to make everybody happy. I guess one of my concerns <coughs> is uh, the paragraph on page two mentions that where property owners and tenants will be notified. Historically, it seems like we've got this dilemma where the city states we notified them. And then the, the, the resident says, we never received that notice. I realize the difference of an expense, but I would prefer that we use some kind of a registered mail for, for at least the city to be able to take the position that that invitation or that notice was actually delivered to that particular address and somebody actually signed for it. Yeah, because this is a legal process. We'll have to show that this time. We'll have to do that for the plan to show that we tried to contact them. But this isn't a general invitation like we did before of, hey, come to the share, you know, come to like an open house type thing. That's, this is not what this is. We actually have to sit down with them, discuss their business plan, what they, you know, how they use their access today, you know, what their truck deliveries look like, all that sort of stuff. And then get those kind of details and then discuss with, and then come back to them and discuss what we think the plan is. Well, but I, I disagree because on page two, it says property owners and tenants of minor access points will be included in public, public project or public <laughs> project public forums. That's not a one-on-one. -on -one. The one-on-one's discussed in another section. Right. So the general public, the citizens of Canyon City, get to weigh in on this access management plan because they're driving it. So the general public still gets to weigh in. I'm speaking to the specific property owners that will be impacted directly on their property. Those will be the one-on-ones. Um, the other public style meetings, they're welcome to come to those, but those are aimed at the general public to come in and comment. So like the mayor who's unhappy with the <laughs> things currently, even though he doesn't own a business there, he might come and complain about that. He can't come. <laughs> he probably will. All right. Okay. Well, yeah, when you get scalded once, you don't like doing it again. It's not a good experience. So thank you, Adam. Appreciate it. Any other additions, corrections, comments? I, I Mr. just Wade? have a comment, and maybe Chief Harvey can respond to this. Uh, this memorandum of, of understanding with uh, PCC, when I was reading through that, it's been quite a while since I've been out there, but I didn't realize they had any traffic enforcement officers at all. And, uh, and it, this sounds like uh, not only do they have them, but they have uh, a fairly extensive list of what I would call police powers. And do they have a police force or a, 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 do they have police powers? Yes, sir, they do. Uh, PCC actually has a police department with act, uh, a chief of police that's stationed out of actual Pueblo. And there is an officer that's assigned to our campus. He's actually one of our former officers and he would handle anything at a lower level that happened at PCC. This MOU will actually help should a uh, uh, accident with a fatality, for example, occur, then they would request assistance of sure. one of our folks with expertise to go there. But they do actually have arrest authority and uh, actual police officers there. Okay, and, but uh, PCC is within Canyon City city limits. Yeah, and so, I mean, Correct. you would have, you. I guess uh, de facto have police power there as well. You you don't need an invitation, right? Correct. Okay. Alrighty. Thank you. Okay. Any other additions, comments, directions? If not, I'd like to have a motion. A second. <clears throat> Mr. Meisner. I move that we approve the uh, with. I move that we adopt the agenda, the consent agenda. Second. Second. Mr. Second. Would you, any discussion on that motion? Would you call a roll, please? Councilmember Meisner? Aye. Councilmember Hawkes? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Councilmember Extra? Aye. Councilmember Schumacher? Aye. Councilmember Weed? Aye. Councilmember Gill? Aye. 
approved by unanimous vote. Okay, moving on. Number seven is Southern Peaks Regional Treatment Center update. Oh, I'm sorry. We missed the administrator's report. Didn't mean to, Tony. I'm really ready to get this meeting going Just here. a highlight for the public that they've been provided notice on the citizen survey. They received the first survey. About a week ago, the second survey should, be, should arrive by today. Please fill it out. It's critical to the direction of the city, so we appreciate their engagement in the survey process and look forward to sharing the results shortly after Labor Day. And they can go online and take it as of right now? The, Non-scientific no. online will be available after August the 28th. Okay. Yep. Okay. Thank you, Tony. Now, number seven, Southern Peaks Regional Treatment Center update. Do we have an update from Southern Peaks? Is someone here from Southern Peaks? Yes, I thought you were. Come forward. Could we have your name and what your position is? My name is Brandon Miller. I'm the facility director at Southern Peaks Regional Treatment Center. I want to thank everybody for allowing us to come back and follow up on our last uh, meeting. Um, we were, my understanding, I'm sorry. My understanding from the last uh, city council meeting, we were to follow up on three areas. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong. The review of our protocols around uh, absences, uh, AWOLs and runaways, as well as uh, the police contract that we had in place, as well as the notification system, uh, looking at a notification system for the surrounding community members at Southern Peaks. Um, we did all three areas. Uh, the first one, updating you on, is reviewing our protocols. We added a staff, an extra staff member uh, that walks around the perimeter to be able to respond quickly on the facility for staff, uh, kids to, who walk off uh, wherever they're at. We started that right around the time we had this meeting. Uh, I think it was in May, was it, the last time we met? Um, so we added that staff member as well. Uh, we also looked at our police contract and early on, and we have enhanced it by doubling it to up to two shifts per day for seven days a week now versus the one shift we were doing uh, at a fixed time last time we, we met. And then the third, the third uh, request was the notification system. Uh, we started out looking at Infinite Campus, which is what the school used. Uh, uh, we found that to be not meeting what we could, you know, user friendly as much as uh, we were looking into it. So. Based on my meeting with uh, Chief, uh, Chief Harvey over there, he suggested Everbridge, and we adopted that. And it's a much user-friendly system. Uh, so we've been in works with Everbridge to set up that system as we currently speak. Uh, we did mail out the enrollment letters to the community at a two-mile radius from Southern Peaks. Uh, I, they should be receiving them today, tomorrow. We mailed them out last Wednesday. I think I was talking to somebody back there that just got it today. So, uh, so we're on our ways with that as well. Um, and that's where we stand with uh, the request that you guys made. Do you guys have any questions for me or any follow-up? Could I ask you, could you explain, it's my turn. Yeah. Could you explain that it's a reverse, so people have to give you their number so you, you put on a, a a system that will call them, warning them that someone has walked away. Yes. And that's what the form was for. Yes. Uh, it, so the, the letter says that to notify uh, my administration director, Lori Billington, to uh, work through the enrollment process through Aboriginal, basically the uh, contact system, and they'll be on a contact. Um, and we'll have, the administrators will have on their phones, and if we do have a runaway, uh, we'll be able to, with the press of the button, send an automatic uh, uh, notification out to anybody that's enrolled in that system, okay. notifying of a, of a runaway, as well as a return as well. Okay. Any other questions of Bradley? Chief, would you address us at this time? Sure. Uh, Derek Harvey, Chief of Police, Canyon City. 
So in your packets, um, ladies and gentlemen of the council, I have included a report that basically identifies uh, trends and analysis for the last, well, since 2004, so the last 13 years. Uh, since these protocols were put in place in the last 18 months by the facility, there has been a marked reduction in the number of uh, crimes and incidents that are happening out at Southern Peaks. AWOLs or runaways um, have almost been cut in half, to be perfectly honest. So. Whether or not the protocols that are put in place are actually the cause of this reduction, it's hard to say without additional data. Um, going back as far as 2004, the, the data does fluctuate and depends on a number of different variables. But something else that uh, Mr. Miller um, has also implemented that I think is, is pretty profound is putting a person in place that will actually do screenings of new clients that are going to be coming out to Southern Peaks. So essentially what that person's responsibility is, is to look at their case, look at their history, and find out whether or not they can actually be successful in the program or whether or not they have a, um, a potential for disruption or other issue, causing other issues at the facility. Uh, that's a pretty, pretty bold step forward and obviously cost the facility. So I'm hoping that our conversations, they were very productive, will continue. And I've reached out to the Colorado Department of uh, Human Services and their representative that oversees facilities like Southern Peaks and have started dialogue with them so that if other issues come up in the future that we'll be prepared to communicate at state level as well as the local. Any questions of the chief? Mr. So, Master? In our last discussion, which you, you weren't here, but one of the th issues in the minutes mentions that they are going to establish a protocol for repeat offenders, which I didn't necessarily read in their information, but is the hiring and the screening going to address that? I, I'd turn that over to Mr. Miller, but I believe it would. Yeah, and I believe, uh, as we discussed last time, we do have uh, a protocol for the repeat offenders at this point, I'm enhancing that protocol by adding more information into what we call a yellow flag, red flag process, uh, which will include the amount of absconding from the facility as part of that equation. Uh, so basically what I took was a system that we already had in place from our sanctuary model and added the absconding as part of that. So when the repetitive uh, behavior of absconding occurs, that will notify, they'll call a red flag meeting to discuss either exit strategies or different strategies to work with that, that individual. Does that answer your question? Sure. Okay. But did you want to continue? If nobody else has a question. Okay. Question two. Uh, are these notifications by text or voice or do they have their option? Uh, I'm not entirely certain at the moment. Uh, they set the training up for us to come, for Everbridge to come down within the next couple weeks to work us through the system. I'm not uh, an IT person, so uh, uh, from my understanding, it could be both, but I'm, I don't want to be quoted on that uh, I, at the moment. I've if, got familiarization with those systems. They generally will call cell numbers, landlines, provide email connections, and text. It's pretty standard now for those companies. When do you anticipate a system being in place and functional? Uh, this month. Pardon? This month. So by September 1? Yeah. On our end, from a corporate standpoint, all of it's been approved. It took quite a few steps on our end uh, to, because it's IT, it was another layer that I had to go through. So from our end, so now it's just working with Everbridge to uh, set their end up with it. So I think that, that'll move pretty quickly. Does that system have the possibility of running a, a test? Tony, do you know? I mean, on September yeah, they 1, generally we, will do some on September testing. 1, we could do a test and say, yeah, yeah. we're going to notify the 53 people that wanted to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't see why not. But again, I don't want to speak for them until I meet with them directly regarding the ins and outs of yeah. the system. Councilman, I might be able to speak to that. Uh, the Everbridge system is used by several agencies, including CDOT, for uh, traffic alerts in certain areas. Um, and it will send out a text. You can do it as a test. Uh, so th that would be very easy for us to do. The issue will be is if anybody's actually signed up to receive those tests. Well, I realize that it's expense, but 
that was one of the concerns they've had, and if they decide not to sign up by their choice, at least we're providing the service. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anyone else? Are there any comments from the audience at this time? Thank you, Brian. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Would you step forward and have your name and address? I think I know who you are, but. <laughs> Rick Shepard, 281 Four Mile Lane. Have a question. You said that you added a second shift. What time of days are both of those shifts? Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. So we th set the schedule. You're talking about the police contract? The police? Yes. Yeah. Uh, we set the schedule up for three shifts per day where they'll be elected, they can be elected up to two shifts out of those three shifts randomly at the, uh, as the police officers signed up for it. So the shifts are, I believe, 7 to 11, 2 to 6, and 8 to 12 throughout the week. So it's the police's discretion what shifts demand of those three? Yes. Typically, uh, they'll be post. I've seen them posted right outside over in the corner uh, by the golf course there. Okay. So thank you. Mm -hmm. am, I, am I correct on that, Chief Harvey? Yeah, that's accurate. Okay. And the reason for randomizing the uh, shifts is so that the folks or the clients there at Southern Peaks aren't aware of when the police are actually there. It was a way that we thought we might be able to further incentivize staying inside the facility because the police might be out there. Okay. okay. Anyone else in the audience like to comment or have questions? Okay. Um, I, I do have a Go question. Ahead. Will we be receiving an end of the year re report? So in the, through the end of the year, we can see how things are going. So I, I noticed on the reports that we're about 50% below on runaways, but we still have another good five and a half months to go for the rest of the year. I'd like to see how things are progressing and if we need any other kind of tweaks to the, to the system. We can definitely provide that at the end of the year and do an annual report. Just quickly, uh, who made the charts? It was uh, my <coughs> assistant, Valerie Lane. Uh, the, the pie chart shows runaways at 28 and the, the verbiage are Column chart shows it at 26 for 2017, so there's an <coughs> error there somewhere. It's only 2%. Yeah. Two people. Two people. I guess I'm a little curious what happens. I saw that there is a report of one manslaughter on yeah. Southern Peaks in 2017. I Can I too. learn a little more about that? It's a little yeah, so there's going to be some information I won't be able to share about that uh, just because of the age of the folks that were involved, but essentially, um, there was a fight that occurred inside the facility and the duration of the fight lasted roughly 17 seconds or so um, from the video but during that time period several individuals attacked one individual and during that he was uh, pretty severely beaten now he did survive so it didn't go through um, uh, as a, an actual death but because of, of the severity of his in injuries, um, that was the charge that was done. You also notice that there is a, a, a drugs case that wasn't in the previous year as well. So that's why I said it's very hard to determine based on one year's worth of data whether the things that we're doing are actually having an impact or there, there's a number of different variables that we could look at there. So um, I, I think continued monitoring of those data might be important for us as a police department and obviously help our conversations with Southern Peaks. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for taking you. a proactive Thank you. approach and working with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. Part number eight is ordinance number 22, series 2017. This is the second reading. It's an ordinance amending section 13.04.120 of the municipal code. Clerk, could you read it by title, please? Yes, this is a bill for ordinance number 22, series of 2017, and ordinance amending section 13.04.120 of the Canyon City Municipal Code concerning the provision of water services 
to properties outside the city boundaries. Could I have a motion and second from council? Mr. Weed. Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council make the motion to approve ordinance number 22, series of 2017 on second reading. Second. Schumacher second. Any discussions on that motion? <clears throat> Hearing and seeing none, would you call the roll, please? Council Member Weed. Aye. Council Member Schumacher. Aye. Council Member Smith. Aye. Council Member Meisner. Aye. Council Member Jaquez. Aye. Council Member Gill. Aye. Council Member Ekstrom. Aye. Approved by unanimous vote. Okay. Number nine is ordinance number 23, it's a series 2017. It's an ordinance referring a ballot issue for lodging tax. Uh, I will need three to introduce, but before I do that, I just would like to add from the mayor, I'm not crazy about putting this on the ballot in November. So I will need three to introduce. Mr. Schum uh, Ms. Schumacher, Jacques and Mr. Weed. Would you read my title, please? This is a bill for ordinance number 23 series of 2017, an ordinance referring a ballot issue to the register electors of the city of Canyon City, providing for a 5% lodging tax to be imposed for the purpose of promoting and marketing tourism and tourism related special events and activities in the Canyon City and the Rural Gorge region. Thank you. Could I have a report from the city administrator, please? Yes, uh, we've been working in concert with all the key members of the tourist industry and not only Canyon City, but the region, lodging, uh, recreation, the bridge to train, for example. Uh, the recent council you appointed is unanimous in supporting placing this measure on the ballot for several reasons. We've provided you some information. First and foremost, one of your strategic priorities is the economic development. Probably the weakest area of the citizen survey was the public's response to the economic prospects in this community. Only 24% felt it was positive. Only 11% felt employment was a positive opportunity here. So that's significant. Secondly, tourism floats all boats. In the state of Colorado, for example, uh, they spend $9 million promoting tourism to Colorado. It generates $19 billion in visitor spending, and that includes $1.2 billion in state and local taxes. We are highly dependent in Canyon City on the sales tax. It represents 65% of our core government spending. Um, this is a vital element of, in, of an uh, effort to try to increase that. Uh, for example, in Fremont County, 65 million was spent creating 836 jobs, and that was with a marketing budget of 200,000. We're talking about the potential tripling of that budget which, for example, it could increase sales taxes and lodging taxes significantly, which helps offset other tax burdens of this public, but more importantly, adds value and increased quality and amenities to this community to make it richer, more diverse, and more vibrant and successful. Because um, the rest of the economy, to be honest, is stagnant. Uh, this is one area that's a bright spot that we could infuse by tripling the marketing efforts, and I think we'd get an immediate return on that. Waiting a year puts us a year behind our competitors. For example, Durango, similar size, spends a million dollars a year. Slida, small enough, spends 580000 Alamosa is uh, similar size, spends 650000 Crested Butte and Gunnison combined are small enough. They spend $1.9 million just for the summer and shoulder seasons. That does not include winter. Um, Glenwood Springs, 930,000, they're a third of our size. Uh, Estes Park is smaller, they spend $1.8 million. Grand Junction Larger spends 2.1. We are falling further and further behind the competition. This is one area of our economy we can truly infuse with growth and opportunity and drive people, particularly overnight visitors. In the state of Colorado, overnight visitors represented 82% of the spending. We like day trippers, but the overnight guest is a, who really drives the economy for the lodges, for restaurants, retailers, gas stations. It has a significant effect. And that was one of the key elements of this proposal is to match the proposed lodging tax. And the state and national data supports that match by indicating that 29% of the spending occurs in accommodations, 23% on transportation, largely fuel, 21% uh, recreation, rafting, train, rural gorge, uh, and then 13% uh, retail. So clearly all sectors of the economy would be benefited by this effort. 
Any questions? Was that a report or an advertisement? That's a sales pitch. <laughs> That's a sale. Well, I asked for a report. We didn't get it. Anyway, any questions from council? What was your suggested or proposed 2018 budget contribution from the city? 300000 which would match the projected uh, lodging tax generated within the city. Last time I thought it was $125,000 match. Currently, you're investing through marketing efforts about $140,000. So the net increase is about $160,000. So we would roll all our marketing dollars into this match. And the trickle down of it will increase the sales tax. And the lodging tax, the which is our <coughs> chief source of income for the entire city. I mean, it clearly has a huge ripple effect, not just on taxes for local government, more importantly, for jobs, good paying jobs and for businesses. And so any monies that would be gone, such as through the Chamber of Commerce or anything else, will have to go through this tourist board? Yes, if it's tourist related, so that's it takes in the it ordinance. out of the hands of the city council? So no, the council has to adopt any proposed budget from the tourist council. You're the final arbiter of, of budgets. Okay. Mr. Meisner? My concern is with the concept of this whole process. I think that that makes sense. My concern is the potential conflict of having potentially four tax issues on the November ballot. And at some point, I mean, we're making the assumption that if we because we all believe in this, that if we approve this, that um, all of our voters are gonna see the same light that we see and that it's only a lodging tax. Somebody has to go through a tremendous educational process to make everybody understand that. But, but for my position, more importantly, my timing, the, the timing is inappropriate in terms of some other community issues that go on. I would suggest that the city continue to contribute the 300,000 to get this committee working and off the ground, and then we look at it in 2018. That's my position. Well, yeah, we, we don't have anything. You don't, you have, you're trying to get an issue passed, and then what? If you're come trying to sell it to me, I wouldn't be that crazy about it. We have no budget. You, what are you gonna, where are you gonna do with this money? We do have and a budget, gonna we have already have a committee. The budget of the I know you have a committee, but you have no plan. And now you're gonna put it on the, bu on the budget, on the ballot in November. The, the budget of the Tourism Council will be submitted to this council at the same time as all other city budgets. They will have a plan, they're working prior on to market. November. Prior to, prior to yes. voting in November. Yes. And it will yes. define where the money will what be the spent. items, where it's gonna go, and what they're gonna spend it on. Yes, mm -hmm. they already are working on a marketing plan, then the budget plan will follow. Uh, as it relates to the public, the public here is already fairly educated as to the difference between a sales tax, a lodging tax. They just lifted the county sunset provision on the <coughs> county's 2% by 75%. I think the public understands better than we might give them credit for that this is a tax on visitors. This is not a tax on the general residents or business of this community. In fact, we're taking a lead from Lafayette, which had a similar proposition, and they called it the tax you don't pay. That's true. Unless you stay in a lodge or a hotel or a b and B, you're not paying this tax. The public understands that. But we are having a campaign to educate the public to make that distinction. And if there was a concern about too many measures, we have a Tabor measure on there. There didn't seem to be any consternation about that. That is an impact on everyone in the community. I know, Tony, but we had no choice. Yeah. We had very little choice about the Tabor. Well, so I think that's apples and oranges. Let's move on to something else. Mr. Okay. Weed. Yeah, well, it's, um, the city's talking about two measures on the ballot. And, and, and the Tabor issue, well, the, the nice thing about the two tax measures that the city has on the ballot is that neither one of them costs anyone, any resident of the city, money. any more money than they're already paying. There's, there's no tax increase unless they decide they're going to stay in a motel. 
And, uh, and the reason the Tabor thing is on the ballot this year is because it expires in two years and it would be foolish to wait until the last moment to put that on the ballot. Um, as, as far as the, the committee will do an educational effort, and I think it'll be similar to what we saw for the 2A, uh, getting the message out, but this community has twice already approved uh, a lodging tax, the, or the original lodging tax and then an extension of that lodging tax. So, that, I mean, that's, that's happened twice already. I, I think the community already understands it. There's going to be some discussion about, well, you know, now it's 5% instead of 2%. I also, uh, you know, the question is, what's the urgency about this? Well, the, the, the urgency, it, it's kind of like motel rooms. Uh, if they're empty today, there's no way you ever recover from, you, you can't rent the room tomorrow that you didn't rent tonight. You can't rent it twice. It's, uh, it's, uh, it doesn't work. And the same thing with tourism promotion. The promotion you don't do this year, you can't do next year. It's lost. Uh, so. You lose. You lose the money. And, and a lot of people don't understand the trickle-down effect, and I didn't before I got involved with FCTC, which has been a real eye-opener and an education for me. And um, the trickle-down effect is amazing. And I even have two customers that are raft guides that used to take off for greener pastures in, on Labor Day, who now are here in their residence year-round because there's been enough revenue generated that they can get jobs during the winter here. And that's tax money in the bank because they have to buy groceries and they buy clothing and you don't realize the trickle down effect of this until you stop and think about when you go on vacation or when you take a weekend or somewhere, exactly what you're doing and where you're spending. It's not just going out and having fun and blowing some cash. If you really stop and think about it, the trickle-down effect is amazing. And I've got clients that, well, not very many anymore, most of them have moved on, but that have moved here because they came to vacation here. Okay. And it's, it's really an amazing process. Right. And, uh, Thank you. You know, I'm Thank with uh, Dennis that um, this doesn't affect citizenry. It doesn't affect us financially, so. Okay, could we have any, any comments from the audience? Anybody like to come address this issue? All right, could I have a motion and a second? Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion um, to approve ordinance number 23, series of 2017 on first reading. I'll second that. Mr. Weed, any discussion on the motion? I have another question, just a technicality. The, there's currently a 2% that the county collects within and the, the city. The county collects. Yeah. That would go so away. So if this were implemented, it, the 2% the would go away, yes. and we have a 5% just city. Yes. Which the county would I still collect 2% really outside of the city. Right. Mr. Eckstrom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. A um, couple questions regarding timing. Mm -hmm. um, is uh, this coming to us tonight is necessary so that we can get it on the ballot. Um, we could pull it off the ballot at any time moving forward. Is that true? Not after second reading. Not after second reading, okay. Second reading means you're setting it on the ballot, it's going to the ballot. Okay. Um, and then my next question was regarding the uh, results of the survey. When do we expect to get those back? Shortly after Labor Day. Okay. Yeah. I, I had a similar question with that. If maybe getting the results from the survey wouldn't be wise before we move ahead with an election so we know where we're standing and how much community support we really do have. Well, the, the law requires us to have this final hearing by August 21st. You're not going to get the results until after that. Uh, you place a similar 2A ballot before the results of your survey last year. That was a much more arduous required but campaign. But we started our education campaign yeah. in February. True, but again, this, as Dennis has indicated, the sales, uh, the, the lodging tax issue has been addressed in this community twice uh, with significant support. 
this public does understand the difference. We need to continue to educate them. We can't take it for granted. But they understand this is not a tax on them. This is a tax on the visitor. And that's why they've widely supported both measures that have come before them. We think there'll be equal success, but we're not going to take it for granted. This council will have a very vigorous campaign similar to 2A. Okay, we have a motion and a second. Any more discussion? Let me correct something. You said council. You mean the committee. Yeah. What's it called once, the tourism council. Once we council. approve this on ballot, we, we have to have hands off. Yes. Mm -hmm. I just want to correct that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm yeah. curious what some of your opinions are on this ballot timing. You want to continue? She, she was curious about my opinion. Um, based on the hearing that we had a couple weeks ago, um, everyone in the tourism you know, sector is, is very adamantly, or is very strongly for this. Um, and looking at the numbers, as far as what we currently budget and what other towns are budgeting for tourism, we, there's a definite shortfall and we're under budgeted and I see the value of that. Um, we are a tourist town and I believe we need to start demonstrating that. Okay, any more discussion? Um, I guess I was just say, I, I have sympathy for the school district's concern about the timing of the ballot issues. I also have a concern that we'll u lose our momentum that we've built up for this, just like the DDA, we built up a great momentum for it, and then a few hiccups happened, including you know, the passing of John Havens, and then it completely fizzled. Uh, I'm, w I'm a little worried that, about that. I have gone to several state meetings concerning tourism, and have seen the incredible um, effect that it has in a positive way for them to have an increased budget to market for their communities. And, that, and we go to these meetings and there are a lot of other communities that aren't on this list that are becoming quite aggressive in their tourist marketing. And um, if we don't capture that market, they're going, they're, they're on top of it, they're gonna take it. Okay, any more comments? Would you call the roll please? Councilmember Schumacher. Aye. Councilmember Weed. Aye. Councilmember Paquez. Aye. Councilmember Gill. Aye. Councilmember Meisner. Nay. Councilmember Ekstrom. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Approved by majority vote. Okay, number 10 is public hearing application for a special use event liquor permit for Sons of Italy. September 8th and 9th at Macon Plaza, um, Care Fisher Square, and 6th Street. Here we're here by opening the public meeting. Seems as though we see a lot of you, Mr. Croce. And uh, welcome. Do we have Port for City Hall? Clerk. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. This is John Croce, who's representing the Sons of Italy, who's applied to this council for a special event permit for September 8th and 9th. Uh, for their annual Italian festival. Notice of this public hearing was given by posting the location in the park. This is the fifth, I believe, annual festival that the organization has conducted, which will entail many events throughout the day long, two day long event with live entertainment and music. There will be a food court offering Italian cuisine and local restaurants and various vendors. Alcohol sales from this event will be conducted as a fundraiser for the organization so they can continue their efforts to promote the positive values of the Italian culture. Individuals age 21 and up will receive a wristband, and those underage participants will receive a black X on their hands. Volunteers from the organization will be checking IDs to ensure a legal aid, drinking age and will assist in patrolling the perimeter of the event. A majority of the volunteers have attended the liquor training offered here at the city. An on-site inspection on the premises will be con conducted each day, and once all the requirements have been met, the permit would be issued. Upon review of the applications, the fees have been submitted with the application. The diagram re meets filing requirements. Applicant has permission to use the park area as well as the street area, as which you approved in the consent agenda this evening, and the organization is in good standing with the state of Colorado. So with that, I'd open it up to any questions you may have of Mr. Colucci. Okay, Mr. Mr. Weed? Sure. Hi, John. Thanks for coming down. Oh, no surprises bet. on this list. You've been here a time or two. Uh, yes. But for the record, are you familiar with the Colorado Liquor Code? Yes, I am. 
Is there a copy of the liquor code on file with your organization? There is. How many volunteers do you plan on having for this event? Well, for setup and everything else, probably about 40. Okay, that's a pretty good staff. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, how are they gonna be trained on the liquor code and how many of them will be trained? All of the folks that we have actually serving the alcohol and actually we have, we try to have at least one person available at the gates that have had some sort of training too. Even though uh, at the gates we don't, we don't sell tickets, we don't do anything like that. So uh, they've either been through the course that the city offers for TIP certification or they have been attending bar and working in Canyon City for years. Okay. And are you fully aware that you're responsible for compliance with the Colorado Liquor Code and that any violations of this code may be held against you and or your organization as well as future licensing? I am aware of that. You want to take a moment to tell us a little bit about your event? That sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun. Okay. Oh, and do uh, you have birthday discounts on the drinks? Uh, we do have a list just in of, case somebody had a birthday that day. We do have a list of the council members and the mayor, and we would uh, we're going to check that off as you come through the gate to make sure we know that you attended. But there are no discounts because that's illegal. Okay. Um, our event is actually the eighth and ninth. Uh, we had road closure item F of. A report earlier that had 9th and 10th, so just for the record, it is the 8th and 9th, uh, so people don't get a mixed fee, mixed message. We'll duly note that. Thank you. Um, it's our fifth festival. Uh, we started out uh, with about 1,800 people. We're up to our last year, we had about 4,000 people come through. Uh, we do have entertainment on Friday night. We open at uh, 5 o'clock on Friday. Uh, at 5th and Macon, and uh, we do charge admission Friday night, uh, $5 admission, and we have two bands, and we have uh, Italian food, and we have sausage sandwiches. We have a great lineup of food this year. Uh, that's one of our strong areas. And we have a few of the other vendors that will be open Friday night. We have good security. We, uh, every year we have what we feel is ample security. Uh, we will be open Friday till probably 10, 10.30, see how the, the weather and the crowd is. Saturday we uh, go from 10 in the morning till 10 at night, 10.30, I think is on the permit. Uh, we have entertainment starting at 11 o'clock and running all the way through the end of the evening. Uh, we do have uh, food vendors that will be there all day Saturday. Uh, we have pizza, we have Italian sausage sandwiches, obviously Italian pastas. Uh, we have entertainment starting at 11, as I said, and we have a roving saxophone player. We have uh, an Italian uh, a singer, Lila Mori, sings, uh, start, kicks her event off with uh, the Italian and the American National Anthem at noon. Uh, we have accordion players. We have great bands in the evening again on Saturday starting at 4 o'clock and running through uh, the end of the evening. And both evenings we have domestic beer, we have uh, uh, we have to have Peroni of course, and then we have a lot, a big lineup of Italian wines. Okay. So, and we have quite a few other vendors other than just the uh, the food vendors. Okay. So. Thanks John. Mm -hmm. Are there any comments from the audience at this time? Hearing and seeing, I'm going to go ahead and close the public here and ask for a motion to second from Council, Mr. Weed. Thank you, Mayor. Members of Council, I make the motion to approve the application for a special event liquor permit for Sons of Italy, September 8th and 9th. Second. Mr. Mark, second. Any discussion on that motion? I have none. Uh, go ahead and call the roll, please. Councilmember Weed. Aye. Councilmember Schumacher. Aye. Councilmember Meisner. Aye. Councilmember Smith. Aye. Councilmember Ekstrom. Aye. Councilmember Gill. Aye. Councilmember Hawkes. Have root beer. Aye. Proof by unanimous vote. Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you.
Good luck, John. Number 11 is a public hearing. However, the applicant I do not see in presence of the audience, and we cannot do it without that individual being here. Is that correct? Yes, Mr. Mayor. I'd ask to go ahead and uh, table this until I posted the premises, and I gave her a reminder call this afternoon, or this today sometime, that I still have not seen her uh, here. So I'd ask for this to just be tabled, and I'll bring it back to the next meeting on the 21st. Okay, thank you. Let's move on to ordinance number. Ordinance uh, it's number 12, ordinance number 24, series 2017. This is a first reading. It's an ordinance repealing and re-enacting chapter 12.12 .12 and repealing 12.30 regarding work and encroachments on city-owned property. I will need three to introduce. Mr. Weed, Mr. Ekstrom, Mr. Gill. Would you read my title, please? Mayor, it should read 12.2. Zero, not 12.30. 12.20? Zero. Mm. Yeah, it was, it's wrong in the agenda. It's correct on the document. Okay. Thank Sorry. you. Thank Typo. You. Okay. I just need to make sure I get the yeah. agenda. 2.20. Okay. This is a bill for ordinance number 24, series of 2017, an ordinance amending Title 12 of the Kenyan City Municipal Code by repealing and reenacting Chapter 12.12 .12 and repealing 12.20 regarding work and encroachment on city property. Can I report for the city engineer, please? Yes, thank you, Mayor and Council. Uh, as we discussed at the July 5th General Government Committee meeting, uh, we are bringing this to, to you so that we can um, bring the regulations current and the policies regarding encroachments uh, and work within the right of way. Um, a lot of what we had lacked substance, consistency, and enforcement. Um, one of the things that came up at that meeting uh, was the desire for you, uh, for us to reach out to the uh, contractors that would be impacted. We did send out notice to all the licensed contractors. Uh, I received a um, one call from Avalanche Excavating uh, just for a clarification on the bonding. I received another, a number of calls from uh, Gary Gillis with Gillis Excavating. Um, he's out of town currently. Uh, he said he'd set up an appointment with me when he gets back, but uh, he wasn't overly concerned. He just had some additional questions also about the process for the bonding. And um, then I had a meeting today with the Fremont Sanitation District for a number of their concerns, and I'll go through those in a minute. Um, but then just wanted to point out again, Nothing new in practice in what we're proposing today, except for now all major encroachments will require a permit, and we're changing up the bonding um, that was woefully so low. Uh, previously, we're, we're bringing that up to um, an amount that can actually be used if necessary. On the Fremont Sanitation District notes, they had some concerns in, let's see, it's, 121270, uh, page 8, H6. Essentially what we're talking about here is who, who's required to have a bond. In the old ordinance, we had exempted um, utilities, uh, essentially utilities from the uh, ordinance for bonding because they had their own special setup for insurance and um, I don't know what the right term is, but uh, uh, their security was much greater than maybe a smaller contractor. So um, what we did is we accidentally left out the consideration for the sand district because it calls out for uh, utilities who have franchise agreements. So we're going to put back in language that's similar to the old language that also exempts the Fremont Sanitation District and similar types of entities um, like that um, mutual ditch companies, uh, the phone company, who doesn't have a franchise with us, but are similar to that. So uh, we are gonna correct that for the second reading. Um, and then the other concerns by the Sand District was same page, um, item K, numbers one and two. Uh, what that is is, um, what we again, what we've been already doing in practice. If, um, if there's a utility in the way of a city project, uh, we require those utilities that are using our right of way to relocate if necessary. They obviously have some concerns about that because it could be fairly expensive for uh, sanitary sewer to move uh, and difficult compared to some other utilities. But along those same lines, that's one of the reasons they're not asked to move 
ever, if at all, very often, because usually they're much deeper than everybody else and usually aren't in the way. Um, but however, however in, in current practice now, if there's a manhole that needs adjusted elevation-wise, then they come and adjust the manhole and do that at their cost. So they had some concern with that, but I think, um, again, we've been doing that in practice with them already. Uh, a greater concern if there was a project large enough and significantly changing a, a right away enough where they would have to relocate, um, I think probably then we would be sitting at the table with them um, discussing who's going to pay for what. But that's a, um, as a permittee, they are, have to follow those same rules as far as relocation. And then their final question had to do with, on page 9, 12, 12, 80, A and B. And I think, and, and Jeff Lewis here, and he can speak to this if I'm, if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm the, I think, I believe in our discussion there, they were concerned that they had to have uh, permits for everything that's already in the ground. And that's not what this language is saying. We're not asking people to go back and get permits for excavation work that's already been done. But we're, what we're saying is we're not allowing a grandfathered encroachment. So if, if somebody's already built their living room in the right of way, that doesn't mean they get to stay there. Uh, we could still go back and have them move that if we need to. Uh, that's all I have. How does that, how does that uh, affect the sewer? Well, I, again, I don't know. Jeff can speak to it, but I think okay. they were concerned that they were going to have to go back and permit everything that they've already put in the ground in the past, and that's not what this this is asking. That this is not what this is doing. What this is doing is saying, just be, we're basically eliminating the the idea of eminent domain on the public right away. We're saying just because just because you already did it before this was enacted doesn't make it okay. Is that right, Catherine? <laughs> right? Let me clarify that just a little right. bit. Um, so what we're saying is you don't have to go and get a permit under this ordinance for facilities within the right of way, but the regulations that are in here outside the permitting regulations are applicable to that encroachment. So that's all we're saying. So if someone did build their house into the right of way, they don't need to go back and get a permit. Correct. But the city can come in and ask them to take it out if needed. If, yeah, if it complies right. with this, yeah. Right. But the question was, how does that apply to the sewer district? Um, I don't they know. They don't have a living room there. I, they don't. Yeah, um, I mean, it's okay. I, I think. I think what. Not the head, Jeff, or no? I think what Mr. he was saying. I think what he was saying was they were concerned that they had already installed a sewer line last year, and it and and, the, and they didn't get a permit that met this standard. They had to go get a new permit for that, and we're not asking for that. I mean, that's not the concept of encroachment. That's just they didn't get a permit. Yeah, okay. but, but it's, it's an encroachment that, needs, that normally would require a permit. But we're not asking people so, to go, okay. especially utilities, we're not right. asking them to go back and permit everything that's so in the So in layman's term, existing. if there's a sewer line in our right-of-way, they don't need to go get a permit. Correct. But if it presented an issue in the future, we would have, be able to right. enforce them in a domain. That's correct. Mr. Right. Blue, would you like to come and address us? or? You don't. You don't have to, but sure. Adam did come down meet with us today. Um, I think our our biggest concern uh, is just the clarification of those couple clauses there about relocation of facilities. Um, you know, what exactly does that mean? Um, if and we kind of talked about this today. If the city wanted to put a um, new storm drain in Phelps Avenue, which we just put a new sewer in a year ago or so and just uh, helped with repaving on it, and it conflicted with, the, uh, with our sewer main, would be, we be required to come in and move that at our expense? Um, you know, that, that's, that's where we need the clarification. That's where we're very unclear here. Um, you know, is it, and is it at the whim of the city as, as if we need to move something? I know we've had a little bit of an issue just in the last couple of weeks with the uh, sewer main that we have through Centennial Park. Um, it kind of conflicted with the uh, splash pad construction. Um, could the city with this ordinance in place basically require that uh, to have been moved somewhere? So it's just a, it's a little unknown for us. I mean, uh, relocating a foot of sewer is approximately $200 if we do it ourselves. Um, the schedule is uh, to relocate is, a, I guess, a little uh, tough for us. It is in a 90-day notification. 
you know, it's, that's like dropping everything else that we have going on and go relocating a fairly large piece if the city would require it. I'm not saying that the city's planning to require that, but going forward in the future, it could become a very expensive proposition uh, for us. How it affects other utilities, I don't know. We've uh, talked to Black Hills, we've talked to Atmos. We didn't really get a response from them yet. I think they're still kind of looking over the potential ordinance. But that's kind of where we're at. I, I appreciate you giving me a few minutes to address. And um, I appreciate Adam coming out today, first day back from vacation and, and just sitting down. Oh, sec second day. You were hiding Friday, we couldn't find you. Um, second day back from vacation, coming and discussing it. So um, I'd be glad to answer any questions um, or you know have any more conversation at any time with, uh, with Adam and his group if, uh, if it would be required. Thank you. Thank you. I have, I have some clarifying questions for Adam. So, uh, Adam, if someone was to pull a permit, uh, such as the Sand District in the past for, their, for that work, is it then their responsibility to move, to move it if we did need to put in a storm drain? Yes, and that's the case for any and all utilities. It's, that's the case for anybody that's using the public right-of-way. Uh -huh. um, one difference would be, you know, Jeff mentioned the Centennial Park. The difference there is they have an exclusive easement. So they have a, they have a deeded easement right. document that says they're allowed to be there or else something, something, something. So that's different than just being in the right of way. Um, we, if, if, they, if we had it by separate agreement, had something else for something like Centeno Park, then this doesn't apply. Okay. So permit or no permit, just again for clarification, permit or no permit, if we needed them to move, they would, they would need to move. What if they couldn't move it? Well, I mean, you got to go put some land somewhere. So what if the property owner, that unless the city owns all that property, says, no, I'm not going to let you put it on my property. What do you do then? We don't flush or what? Well, I mean, we could think of a lot of what ifs that are ridiculous. I mean, that's the truth. I mean, no, it's, it's not ridiculous. Well, no, it's, it's, we're not, we're not going to go and have, uh, have, like for the example, let's use the splash pad example. We're, we, their, their, their sewer main is 16 feet below our splash pad. So we're not, that's not, they're not in our way. Actually, we're gonna be in their way. Their concern was us building on top of them. Yeah. So we have that right to do that under that easement agreement. You know, the, the idea is that we all work together. That's why we do utility coordination once a month. And, and we're not gonna ask them to do something because we're all, and, and Jeff knows this, we talked about this before, we're all talking about the same citizens and the same affected consumers. So um, we're not going to go out and ask something that's just blatantly ridiculous or impossible to engineer just for the sake of doing it at the city's whim. I mean, okay. I, we're not in the business of doing that. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Mr. Miser? I have a question on page four, number eight. Why the city tree would be excluded and my tree wouldn't? What's the reason in there? Well, actually, if, it, if it's a tree in the right-of-way, it's a city tree. Yeah, but what if it wasn't? It was, then it can't be there. So if you plant a tree in the right-of-way that the city forester didn't approve, then it's not, a, it's not a permitted tree. But if the city puts a tree or has a tree that's in the right-of-way that is not in conformance with this, uh, or they're not subject to this. Is that correct? Correct. But if you, and if you plant a tree that the city forester approves that then becomes a city tree, it's exempt as well. And the reason for that is, and we've had this discussion recently, <laughs> is we value our urban forest. If, if we don't, and we want to apply the same standard to all our trees that we do other things, then we won't have an urban forest. So it's one of those things which are you going to manage? But you can't put, you're not supposed to put a tree in the right of way anyway unless the, the city approves it, and then we then maintain it there, there on out. Becomes a city tree. Yep. Okay. Any other questions? I have one, but I gotta find it. Hurry up. <laughs> Time is money here. I'm good. <laughs> well, while he's looking, I'll just throw this out there. This, um, I was just curious where he came up with this number of 10 for uh, qualifying for the $15,000 bond as opposed to 5,000 per uh, um, activity. Uh, we just looked at our our regular permittees, and it seemed like a good number. 
Yeah. We it, didn't get any feedback back either other way. Well, it, it, that I, I, was, asked, I asked Avalanche a little bit about it. Um, but we looked at our regulars, so to speak, uh, really, which are local contractors, and that seemed like a good number to include them in the fold because that's the idea. Um, we, we want the fly-by-nighters or the out-of-towners to pay the premium because they have no investment in the community. We don't know if they're right. going to be around. So those will be the ones that have to bond each and every job based on its value. And we're saying, hey, the local guys that work here all the time, they're going to just they're just going to give they're going to do what they do now they're going to give us one bond usually lasts two years and they're good to go okay. and we don't have to evaluate every one of their permits sure have okay, you? i guess i've been out of town for a little while and what is, what is the purpose of, of making these changes to our current plan what are so we w there was a number of discussions last number of months over um, some encroachments and license agreements and how those were handled. There were some inconsistencies there. Um, and then we started looking harder at our encroachment right away existing ordinances and regulations and they were lacking big time and the attorneys were concerned about that. Um, we had a lot of policies but they weren't ordinances and so we wanted to bring all that together, what we're doing in practice, put it in the book. I found my question. Mr. Meisner. Okay, back to trash. Okay. You put in the 96, which I appreciate. Mm -hmm. I'm understanding that a, that a typical 96 little roll around thing uh, could be moved out next to the street on the day of delivery. And if, and if it's not the delivery day, it's in violation. Right. But you could not park a regular, what's it, a three yard dumpster, whatever that square boxes right you could not park that next to the street right mm -hmm. it would have to be off of the right unless away. it's permitted unless it's, yep they can yep. come in and get a permit for a construction dumpster the rest will be handled the stuff that's on site will be handled in your trash ordinance that's coming to you in a month or so and there'll be some cross-reference but this deals with only right-of-way so they can put a dumpster in the right-of-way but it'd be a construction dumpster and it'd be have a have to have a permit. have to have a permit yep but they couldn't park it beside the road? No. Well, they could, depending on what the conditions are. What are the conditions of the permit are? For example, there's, there's a big ditch or drop off or something and there's really, there's no other place to put it. Then we might say, okay, yes, you can put it here in this travel lane, but it's gotta be properly signed and barricaded and different things. I'm talking about non-permitted, like we're seeing around. Non-permitted won't be allowed. No dumpsters in the right-of-way, unless it has a permit. Okay, so shall we move on? Yes. Mr. Lippis, would you please come forward? You've been waiting patiently, rubbing your head. I saw that, with your hat off. Come on up. Did you give us your name and your, you leave your hat on, that's fine. No, I'll take it off. Okay. <clears throat> My name's Ray Lippis. I own Ray Lippis Escobarian LLC. I really would like to ask if council knows. Need to get over to the, there you go. <clears throat> Why? We're going to fifteen thousand dollar bonding, and I'll and I'll explain that to you. At the first of the year, you passed an influx of permitting cost to the public that they don't even know what happened to them. Am I right or wrong? I think you're right. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Okay. So it took you six months to decide that our thousand dollar bond wasn't gonna cut it because our permits are so high, we had to take it to 15,000. Now, is that fair to the people? It don't cost me nothing. But the people that need a water line or a sewer line, now some of their permits are costing them $3,000 just for the right to do it. Are you do you understand this? No, I don't. I'll be quite okay. honest with and you. And then my so. question to you, sir, is why you don't? Well, the way you it was portrayed, it, it was, was, was well, the way it was portrayed to us, not being in your business, it was that it probably would be very infrequent and only done on new streets. That's the, how I the, understood the, the, it. It goes on the every street was addressed, right or wrong. I'm not for sure if they're right yet, but. I can tell you Park Center had one permit already this year on a water leak 
that was $2,900. Was it on an existing street? Yep. I got a list from our administrator that showed different. I don't know by the particular one that you're talking about that it wasn't it wasn't a lot of money to people. If we're if it's wrong, I think we should talk about it. You I bet. think we needed to address it okay. because this was on Fifth Street, <laughs> four hundred block. That subdivision has been there fifteen years at least, maybe longer. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have a client right now on bar, seven hundred block. I realize each street's a fairly newer street, but where he's doing the wire line it isn't part of that newness. They want to, the, the permit on that would be $2,900 just for the right to go into the street to do his wireline. This is the reason why they're asking for a $15,000 bond now. It's because our permits have gone so high. That's what, that's why the bond's there. Because before, my attitude was that $1,000, don't pay it. Let them come get the $1,000. Protect the people out there, our citizens. That's my complaint. Okay. Thank you much for my, yeah, your time. Thank you, Ray. Thank you. We'll talk to you later. As yeah. a point of information, year to date, we've collected just over $7,000 in street restoration fees. The average fee is about $70. So we'll look into this one particular example of sites, but that would be astronomical compared to what we're experiencing. Well, that's not the first time I heard that, Tony. Yeah. I heard it time and time again, and I don't quite understand. What are we going to do with the $2,900 or $3,000 just for the right to dig into our street? First of all, we need to validate that's true. I mean, there's a lot of urban well, let's, myths let's, in this right. community, and we need to validate whether the statement is Tony, true. Tony, he just said it. Now it must be true. It doesn't square up to? with the data we have. So we'll let me, I know let you us, gave me that sheet, yeah. but I, I, I hear in the public, yeah. I get called about it all the time, about the exorbitant cost of doing the street. What are we doing with the money? It sits in a special fund Did to we restore do that our streets. Excuse me? Now all of a sudden we have an act of conscience that we're going to start doing that. Well, we didn't do it with our city streets ever, and now we're doing it. And all that of a sudden. may explain why we have horrible streets. Well, and now, I, I just think we need to revisit this. I think it's yeah. exorbitant. Yeah. Well, it's well, the first and only complaint I've received on it. So I would like, <laughs> they're not I would calling like to you. see the data, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Mayor and, and Mr. Mm -hmm. Administrator. I would like to see the data on what permits sure. have been pulled and what the average costs are. And, are, and like we said, when we originally visited it, it was mostly going to be the bigger companies that were tearing up bigger streets for bigger projects. But I do have a concern if it's a regular citizen that has to dig in a street, the permit costs that they have to do. Well, and and the replacement it. costs as well. Like a, my, our business is in a different town. We had some you know, really old pipes that we had to replace potentially under the street. And I, and I have to say, Mayor, I thought if this is a really nice street, if this was in Canyon City and I had to pay for the permitting and the cost to replace this on a nice street, it would absolutely be horrible for me as just a you know, regular mm -hmm. person, not a, a major com uh, company owner. And so I'd like to see what the impact truly has we'll, been. We'll provide you that. What, what, what major company? <laughs> what major done? companies were we were we targeting to collect fees from? That's not well, true. Like the bigger what we were doing was preventing doing we're t two things we were trying to do with the SDRF, the street damage fee. We were trying to discourage people from cutting the street. And if we don't have very many cuts compared to last year, then it's, that would be an indication that's working. The other, re the other thing was to collect fees to make the repair because of the damaged road. <laughs> I, it doesn't matter who's small, big, little. I mean, we're not trying to target big companies that come into town. That's not, that is absolutely not true. But that um, doesn't work out because you're making them repair that street when they're done, aren't you? I had to and I did mine. True. Yes. So you're, at, you're, you're and that's they, are, they are patching collecting. the roadway, which we've proven. And so you're holding $3,000 sometime in the future. Uh -huh. Whether snow plows, anything else beats it up. And I doubt whether you're doing that. It hasn't been done in the past. Well, why would you doubt we're doing so, that? That's what you told because us you to haven't do. done it. Well, right, but that that money that we collect goes into that street restoration fund. It, it, it does. We I don't know. I don't know this. why somebody would suggest yeah. it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah. We've only been in this now for six well, months. Well, okay. apparently we have Let's just move on. I, I just don't agree with it. I I think that it's exorbitant, and I've had more than one people call me about it. I don't care if they haven't called him or not. They're calling me. Yeah. I, and I don't care for it. We'll provide. I'm not for, arguing. I'm not arguing. Well, you provided before, and it didn't see it on there. What's that? You provided this sheet before, and I didn't see it on there. You would have requested it, and I gave it to you. Okay. If you wanted I, it for the full council, we'll provide it at the next meeting. Let's do that, meeting. then. On another note, the $15,000 bond, we came up with that, comparing that to other agencies, 
It's actually a lot lower than most surrounding agencies. Um, it has nothing to do with the SDRF whatsoever. We've known for a long time our $1,000 bond is woefully inadequate. Um, you, if someone goes and tears up a sidewalk and some pavement to put in a water line and walks away from the job, it's, there's no way we're going to go back and restore that for $1,000. And we have data that we could show that. So uh, They have to provide a bond. Right. Okay. One time I had a wide load permit in Texas. I had to provide a bond for $20,000 mm -hmm. uh, to get my wide load permit for a boat. Mm -hmm. That bond cost me $250. Right. Is this a cash bond that they're putting up, or is this a bond they're putting up? This is a bond they're putting up, so they, they can put up a cash bond if they wanted to. Okay, Most no, this don't. is a bond that they they're buying buy a bond, from a bonding company. Um, and aver an average one is about 5%. So about 5%. So 15000 be 750 bucks for two years. Very good. Thank you. That's my point. Okay. Any other comments from council? Could I ask for a motion and a second? You don't like Go ahead. You don't like if there's a motion, I ask there be a correction for... Uh, including the sanitation district in the bond exemption. Yeah, to change the language on page eight, it's section twelve twelve zero nine zero a six to include municipalities, quasi municipal entities, ditch companies, and other utilities that in the city. Okay, so we're going to ask for a motion to, amend. to the to amend and to correct as per. <coughs> I actually have another one on top of that one. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. In twelve twelve zero eight zero, and this addresses another issue raised by the sanitation district. I'd like to clarify the language and be to exclude going and having to get the permit. That's not as eloquent as I would like it to be at the moment, but that the permitting requirement is not triggered by that provision. Just to clarify that. Okay. I'm going to suggest to council we don't vote on this now. Let's see the finished paperwork whenever all these corrections and slack overs are done. But that's up to you. You're the council. Do we have a uh, motion and a second? We don't have a motion yet if at all. We, if we, we have do. a motion and a second, we have to vote on it. We, we do not have, have a motion. We don't have a motion, don't have a motion okay. and a second. Yeah, then but then but it's can, been introduced, so that so the you'd have to have a motion to table this mm -hmm. since it's been introduced. Well, I, I, did, I just want to make sure as far as making changes, did the utility also have a question on K of 12-1270K on relocation of facilities, as well as the the bond on 12-1270A. So do, do your changes address both of those? There is no changes on K, is there? No, we're not recommending any changes for relocation. Okay. I'd like to, uh, you to make a motion to table us and to get the verbiage straight so everybody knows what the heck's going on. And could I hear that? Table to August 21st. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I move that we table to August 21st, ordinance number 24, series of 2017, till we can get the change in the text, maybe some more background information. Second. Okay. Any discussion on that motion? Would you call a roll, please? Councilmember Smith? Aye. Councilmember Extra? Aye. Councilmember Gill? Aye. Councilmember Schumacher? Aye. Councilmember Meisner? Aye. Councilmember Haquez? Aye. Councilmember Weed? Aye. Approved by unanimous vote. Okay, let's move on to 13A. It's a public hearing Thank for you, zone Adam. Pardon? Thank you, Adam. Thanks, Adam. Uh, public hearing for zone change of, at uh, 441 Four Mile Lane. I'm going to hereby open the public meeting. Uh, public hearing, I should say. <laughs> public hearing. Could I have a report from the city planner, please? Yes, Mayor and members of council. Uh, this is a rezoning request, uh, city initiated for an address at 441 Four Mile Lane. Um, the request is to remove the dual zoning on this property, which is R1 and RL, and put the zoning back to RL, which is rural living. Uh, notice was published as appropriate uh, prior to this public hearing. If you may remember that there was um, a proposed subdivision in this area called Lariat Estates Filing 2. It was to have subdivided 64 lots back in 2007. That zoning went through. The preliminary plat never made it to a final plat process, but the zoning 
occurred on these properties. In 2010, it was corrected on all of the lots that were part of this resubdivision, except for this one lot. So this is basically an error that occurred, and we're correcting that. If you'll look at your map, and I have to apologize for the maps in the, um, we're working on getting um, better color copying. Um, you'll see that 441 Four Mile Lane, which is approximately a 17 acre parcel, is split in two with uh, R1 zoning on the east side and RL on the west side. This would simply remove it and make it all RL. If you have any questions, uh, there is a consent to rezone that has been signed by the applicant. Um, the ordinance is in your packet, and if I can answer any questions, I'd be happy to do that. This is actually in anticipation of another subdivision that's coming uh, your way in the next month or so. Thank you, Terry. Are there mm -hmm. any questions from council? We're moving to RL? Yes, rural living. It's kind and of that, like a, that, a state. That zoning is gonna accommodate this hypothetical change or, or development? Yes. Any other questions of council? Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt. What, what, just, excuse me, just a minute. Are there any comments from the city? I mean, from the, from the audience? Okay, hearing none, go ahead. Mr. Mayor, I move that we- close the hearing, sorry. Close the public hearing. I have to go to- oh, okay. okay. I'll introduce. <laughs> Need two more. We extra. Thank you. We have Smith, extra man. Wait. Wait. Okay. Uh, Clerk, would you read my title, please? This is a bill for ordinance number 26, series of 2017, and ordinance rezoning certain real property within the city of Canyon City, Colorado, 441 Four Mile Lane. Could I have a motion and a second from council? What was the number on the top? 26. 26. Yeah. Mr. Mayor, I would like to make a motion that we adopt zone change 441 for a mile lane and removing the dual zoning. Second. Upon first reading. Mr. Arcade, did you second? Okay. Any discussion on that motion? Would you call a roll, please? Councilmember Smith? Aye. Councilmember Hawkes? Aye. Councilmember Meisner? Aye. Councilmember Weed? Aye. Councilmember Gill? Aye. Councilmember Ekstrom? Aye. Councilmember Schumacher? Aye. Approved by unanimous vote. Okay, we're on number 14A. It's a public hearing for special use review. It's accessory dwelling unit at 696 Reynolds Avenue. I'm going to open the public hearing at this time. Could I report from city planner, please? Yes, Mayor, members of council. Um, Andrew and Paula Shagley um, own property at 696 North Reynolds. It's in the R2 zone district. They are requesting that the single family home that's on that property right now become an accessory dwelling unit. It's about 900 square feet. The lot is three acres. They would like to build another home on the property, which is much larger, and create this small existing single family home as the accessory dwelling unit. Um, staff has reviewed this application as have um, the engineer, the building official, fire district, and sand district. And um, we are in agreement that this um, meets the requirements or can meet the requirements for the ADU. Um, it is, uh, there's access to the property. There's ample off-street parking. The surrounding land uses are residential. There's R1 zoning and R2 zoning. There's existing water and sanitary uh, sewer services. And um, at, this, at the present time, the um, accessory dwelling unit can meet the uh, Chapter 17.15 ADU requirements, <coughs> and those are um, considered to be or suggested to be conditions of approval. The Planning Commission reviewed this at their regular meeting in July. They recommended approval. I'll go through their recommended conditions at this time. It's a little unusual, I will say this, it's a little unusual to create the ADU before you actually have the principal dwelling. It's not unheard of, 
Uh, we, it has been requested of us before. We haven't actually processed an application yet, but what will happen is that they will do this or get their certificate of occupancy and their certificate of compliance for the ADU almost simultaneously. We're giving them 18 months to get that done, um, and they will meet those requirements. An existing ADU basically has to just go through health and safety issues, um, and then it gets what we call a certificate of compliance. They get a home inspection. Um, their electrical and plumbing is uh, looked at by that home inspector, and then our building official goes in it just to make sure that they are meeting safety requirements. So that's what they'll do for the ADU. They'll get a building permit for, obviously, their new home, and then as they start to finish this up, they'll get both of those certificate of occupancy and certificate of compliance for both of these, and then the, both of those um, uh, homes will be legal. So in order to accomplish that, um, the first condition of approval is to, uh, to get both of those certificates of compliance and occupancy. Um, they will get all the building, electrical, and plumbing permits that they need to for um, that certificate of compliance for the ADU. They have to meet the Fremont Sanitation District requirements and the fire district requirements. They may have to put in a uh, fire hydrant, um, and that will be, and they will also have to probably do a turnaround. That will also be looked at while they're going through this process of um, building their home and getting the certificate of compliance for their ADU. Um, and that's basically it. The last one actually gives them um, 18 months to take care of all of this. And it, we've kind of, I, normally I would have given them a year, but this is a little bit more complicated, and so we wanted to make sure they had plenty of time to build their home and then get their ADU in case there might be something else that repairs or something like that that they might have to make to the ADU. Um, in your packet is uh, the advisory report from the Planning Commission, the meeting minutes. The ordinance is there for you as well as the referral comments. So if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them if I can. Thank you, Terry. Any comments of the applicant? Would you like to comment at this time? No? Okay. You, you, we're not going to be hard. I mean, you, anyway. Uh, you're nervous. <laughs> Mr. Mayor. Any, com any comments? I'm going to ask ahead. a really stupid question. There are no stupid questions. If there's an existing house, why can't the one that they're building be the ADU? Well, they wish to build a house that's much larger than the house that they have right now. And this might be for knowledge for me too, but well, in general, the accessory dwelling unit should be subordinate and secondary to the other unit. And one of one of the, those ways is by size. So if you're going to be building a 2,200 square foot house and you have another house that's 900 square feet, it's more appropriate for the ADU to be the 900 square foot house. Okay. Thank you. That's how we would look at it. Thank you. Any other comments or uh, questions from council? Hearing none, I, any comments? Okay, then I'm going to go ahead and close, close the public hearing. And 14B is ordinance number 27, series 2017. This is a first reading. I need three to introduce. Mr. Exter, Mr. Marquez, Mr. Uh, Gill. Mr. Gill, could you read my title, please? This is a bill for ordinance number 27, series of 2017, an ordinance amending section 17.24.050 of the municipal code to add there to a new subsection identifying a certain land use permitted only by special review, accessory dwelling unit located at 696 North Reynolds Avenue. Could I have a motion and a second? Mr. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion. Pardon me. To um, approve ordinance number 2717. Uh, accessory dwelling unit 696 North Reynolds on first reading. Mr. Arquez, I saw your hand come up second. Do you want to second that? You will second that. Could you call the roll, please? Any discussion on the motion? Yeah. Mr. <laughs> Meisner. Are, Paul, are you guys comfortable with the conditions? Yeah. Okay. All right. I should have asked that. I'm sorry. 
Uh, the applicants indicated that they were comfortable in, with the conditions. Okay. Any discussions on that motion at all? Would you call a roll, please? Councilmember Schumacher? Aye. Councilmember Haquez? Aye. Councilmember Ekstrom? Aye. Councilmember Weed? Aye. Councilmember Gill? Aye. Councilmember Meisner? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Approved by unanimous vote. <clears throat> Next is a public hearing for a zone code amendment, title number 17, Noyances. I'm going to open the public hearing at this time. Could I report from the city planner, please? Yes, this is a, an amendment to chapter 1744-050, uh, nuisances. We're adding a couple of clauses into uh, the um, violations and penalty portion of the zoning code. This is um, basically we're adding sections A and B, and this is a cross-reference to the nuisance ordinance. We're going to be bringing um, a revision to the nuisance ordinance before you uh, shortly. And this is, and I may need a little help from the legal staff on sure. this, but. Yeah, I can, okay. I can step in. So we discovered through some of our enforcement mm -hmm. actions that um, a violation of the zoning code is not declared a nuisance, and so we can't use our nuisance provisions to enforce a violation. So this is basically tying those two items together. Okay. And C is actually the language that's in the current code now. Um, would you explain that, and can you, okay. what are you tying together? The nuisance to a zoning violation. So is that essentially in correct? In order to use your nuisance enforcement provisions in Title VIII, something has to be, if, you're gonna, if it's going to be a violation of another chapter, it has to be declared a nuisance in right. that chapter. Title 17 lacked that language. It just said it's unlawful to. I know. can't actually hear you for the channel. I'm sorry. sorry. You need to speak into the mic. Okay. So Title 17 just said, you know, you can't build a building in violation of this code or use a building, but it never declared anything a nuisance. And so you couldn't use the enforcement provisions in your nuisance code, which is Title 8, to enforce any violation of Title 17. Okay. So this now allows the city to do that if it so chooses. It defines the nuisance. It declares a violation of t Title 17 a nuisance. Okay. Yep. Thank you. Any other questions from council? Is your hand up, Mr. Meisner? Thank you. Um, any discussion or any comments from the audience at this time? We're dwindling in numbers. Any further discussion for council? I'm going to go ahead and close the public hearing and go to 15B, ordinance number 28, series 2017. This is the first reading. I need three to introduce. Mr. Meisner, Mr. Gill, and Mr. Ekstrom. Would you read by title, please? This is a bill for ordinance number 28, series of 2017, and ordinance amending section 17.44.050 of the Canyon City Municipal Code to declare that violations of Title 17 are nuisances to bright, provide for enforcement of the city's nuisance abatement procedures. Thank you. Could I have a motion and a second, please? Mr. Ekstrom. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Council, I make a motion that we approve a bill for uh, ordinance number 28, series of 2017, on first reading. Mr. Gill seconds. And any discussion on that motion? Can I get who seconded that? Mr. Gill did. Sorry. Any discussion on the motion? Hearing none, could we have a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Ekstrom? Aye. Councilmember Gill? Aye. Councilmember Meisner? Aye. Councilmember Weed? Aye. Councilmember Haquez? Aye. Councilmember Schumacher? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Approved by unanimous vote. Okay, I need a, we're going to go into an executive session to discuss the city administrator's evaluation. Could I have a motion and a second for that? I think Mr. you Estrum? should cite, uh, sorry, in your motion you need to cite that CSR site in your. Mm -hmm. Please go. He, they've got their sheets. What? It's on your agenda. <laughs> He's oh, got his I'm sorry to steal your fire, Mr. Meisner. Please go ahead. He's our official. Now, now I'm confused. It's on your agenda. In the interest of time, could you recite that? I can, I can do it. I move. Go ahead. Let's go not ahead. argue about this. Mr. Ekstrom, go right ahead. 
Um, I move that the city council hold an executive session. Uh, which number is it? Personnel. Yeah, no. pursuant to 24-6. Oh, yeah. Pursuant to 24-6-402. Uh, for D? No. F. 4F. Thank you. That's the motion, correct? That's my motion. It's, four, it's four F. Could I have a there second? Mr. Gill okay. seconds. Any discussion on that motion? Would you call a roll call vote, please? Councilmember Ekstrom? Aye. Councilmember Gill? Aye. Councilmember Schumacher? Aye. Councilmember Smith? Aye. Councilmember Huquez? Aye. Councilmember Weed? Aye. Councilmember Meisner? Aye. We're going in executive session. <laughs>